All right. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you here this morning. As you can tell from uh, Evan's illustration, I haven't grown much since the time I was a little kid. Um, but uh, it's a pleasure here to be. I'm, I'm really excited to be here with you and uh, very grateful for uh, the church here. And uh, if you didn't know, uh, the church also supports us as missionaries. So as we work uh, with Word of Life, the church here uh, really is part of what enables us to do that. And specifically, um, if you knew this or not, but this, uh, just so you do know, um, that your church here specifically gives um, to enable me to go travel to teach down in Argentina. And so um, this is a, a door that the Lord opened for me. I was a student um, at the Bible College in Argentina. That's where I met my wife, Carla, who's in the nursery with my two sons. And uh, we did a couple years of Bible college there together and, you know, did the whole falling in love thing and, you know, her rejecting me once and then realizing I wasn't as bad as I look. And uh, anyways, we got married, but uh, that school there is, is a huge part of our lives. And uh, I actually um, started praying um, once I left there that God would open the doors for me to one day go back and teach at the bilingual program, never assuming that would happen, but praying that it would. And so it's literally being able to travel. I, I just landed back here in Canada after being stuck in Brazil during the whole election thing for like seven hours and roads being closed to the airport. But um, like literally prayed for nine years to be able to go and do that. And so that was an answer to prayer um, that we've been praying together for nine years. So very excited about that. I have a couple pictures to show. Disclaimer, I'm not a photographer and I don't think about taking pictures unless it's like of my kids with my phone. So these are not great pictures, okay? But just to show you a little bit and explain a couple things um, that went on when I was down in Argentina. So um, this is a picture of me and my uh, newest nephew, Jonas. And uh, so I was excited to be able to meet him and other nephews and nieces that had been born since we'd been there, and then other ones that were like actually that small when we were there and now are taller than me. But um, so it was great to be able to see some family, um, spent a couple days, was able to spend about two and a half days with Carla's um, parents down there because that's where they're from. So that was exciting. Um, this is also an opportunity I had to speak in Carla's parents' church. So uh, while I was down there, it was my first time ever preaching in Spanish. So um, we talk in Spanish at home. It's more like Spanglish than Spanish, but we do like this weird mixture of English and Spanish. And so was able to share um, from God's words um, at Carla's parents' church, which was, which was really cool and an encouraging time for them as well. Um, also was able to um, preach at my best friend, uh, his name's Kede. He goes to another church in the city, in one of the cities, in the city, it's like Buenos Aires, it's a very big city. Um, so he goes to a, a church there, and so they invited me to go speak at that church. So the first Sunday I arrived, I was able to preach there. Um, I told them when I was going down that I was going, because I went down without my family, that it was kind of an opportunity for me to be single for a week, in that I had all this time to do nonstop ministry, and they kept me busy. Like, no joke, I literally would wake up at 7 to get, you know, eat and get ready for class, teach at 8, and then normally get back to my room at 12 when I would look over my notes until about 1, and then like wake up and repeat. So it was a really busy time, but really great. Uh, another awesome part of what I was able to do there is they scheduled me to meet with different missionary families. And so uh, in Argentina, you, you eat a lot. They love food. Um, and so I was able to like meet with different missionary families and hear about what God's doing through their lives and just encourage them, which was really cool just to be able to hear about, how, you know, sitting down and is there something encouraging about someone coming across the world to sit down and eat with you? And so that was really cool. I was able to do that and be an encouragement to some, some people that are there serving that were like um, classmates of mine that God's still using there in different areas, whether it's, you know, my, my friend Kitty, he oversees the missionary school or, you know, one of my friends works on maintenance. And so it was just really interesting to be able to sit down with them and just to encourage them as well. So that was an exciting part of what I was able to do there. Um, this is another picture of me with some nephews. Again, like I don't take pictures, but beyond that, this is some other nephews and nieces that I didn't get to uh, meet until the first time being down there since they were born. So that was really exciting as well. And there's another picture of me preaching at my in-laws church. This is another cool opportunity I had. It's hard to see what's going on here, but this is uh, the top floor of the guys' dorm. And so I was able to do a Devo with them, which started like at 10 o'clock at night. And we were there for a while and had 
um, a good time, but we're just sitting all in the hallway there and just able to, you know, share with them um, what God's done in my life. And this church is a huge part of that story. Um, you know, wasn't really living for the Lord, and it's different people here that God used in, in, to encourage me to get on track for God. And so being able to share some of that with them and then just encourage them through the word um, to make God their refuge and to challenge them to finish their year strong because they're finishing up their Bible Institute year there as well. And... This is me and my father-in-law, so we it's again another exciting time to spend time with them. We're getting ready to go to church on Sunday, and so it's really good to be with him. He's not tall either, which is nice. <laughs> All right, uh, this is one of the highlights there. I apologize if you're a vegetarian, but uh, Argentina has like world-renowned meat, and so we, uh, the day before I left as a family, we all got together. There was like 15 of us, and we bought 25 pounds of meat and um, ate most of it. So it's, there's nothing better for me personally than having a plate that consists of only meat, and that's it. There's salad on the table, but it's almost disrespectful to eat the salad when there's that much meat. So uh, anyways, that was just a really good time. So I, I appreciate your support. My real purpose for going down there um, was to be able to teach a, a class. So I was able to teach the, uh, the book of Colossians to the bilingual students. So my course was in, in, in English, and I was able to interact with the Americans there um, who are very, um, it was kind of funny because as Canadians, we're like, it's very stereotypical for being nice. And so I had like one not nice question on my exam because my exam's far too easy. And they're like, oh, that wasn't very Canadian of you to have a mean question. I was like, I'm sorry. They're like, that's, that sounds more Canadian. So uh, it, it was really good. And honestly, just such an encouragement. Um, sometimes uh, you need to, if you haven't had an opportunity to, to go and be in a different part of the world, um, just realizing um, some of the things that we place as so important and that we need to be content, you just don't need um, you know, and so for me, you know, like for my nephews and nieces, um, they, they don't, they come from not a lot. And, you know, just, we were able to bring down a couple gifts, like a sweater. And you would think I was giving every kid like an Xbox one or whatever, the new Xbox, like they're just, and it's just a sweater. And, but for them to like have a new sweater for the first time, and as long as I can remember was like incredible for them. And it's like smoking hot and they're wearing them around the house. But it's just, it's just one of those things, right? Where I'm um, just being reminded of that or even just, you know, visiting missionaries in their home and their home is one room where the stove is and the bed is there, but it's folded up into the wall and they're not embarrassed about it. They're excited to have you there and they're just doing ministry and just faithfully serving the Lord. And so um, it was just super encouraging for me. Um, part of what I'm gonna share this morning um, really ties into that. So we'll get to that again. Um, but just really grateful for the church here and for supporting us, for enabling um, me to go and do that and to be a blessing there. It's just an extension of the ministry that God's doing in and through your lives here. So thank you very much. And if you have any other questions, um, I'd love to, to share more about the trip and some different things um, that God was able to do during my time there. So that's it for, we can pop that off. I know it's exciting, but we got to wait for lunch. So, all right, so let me open a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll dive into the message this morning. So let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this morning, God. I just thank you for this time where we can get together as a body of believers and to just be encouraged by your word. God, I thank you for your words and just for uh, how it helps us to, to realize what's important in life, how it helps us to honor and to glorify you, Lord. And I pray that that would be the desires of our hearts, that we would just have this um, this passion, Lord, to get to know you more. And as we get to know you more, God, just that transferring into just loving you and living for you more. God, I thank you so much for this church. I thank you for Pastor Paul and for Kim and their ministry here. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would continue to keep uh, the church members and the, just the church here faithful to you and faithful to your words um, in the ups and downs of life. In your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Philippians chapter 3. This is the first time in my preaching career where I actually planned to potentially finish early. No promises, but it might happen, okay? Because I just realized as I was preparing for this message, um, this is such, I think, a, a powerful and important biblical truth for us to understand. I didn't want to add too much more to that. So we're really only going to look through um, primarily three verses in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15, um, but one of the things that God has used as I've been studying through this passage and reflecting on it for a number of months now um, is just how important it is to be part of the body of Christ. 
And, and by that I mean um, beyond just the, the big picture church, I'm talking about being in a local body of believers, how, how important this is, what you're here doing right now, being in church. This is, this is a vital part of the Christian life because if there's one thing that I, that I realized from the, the ups and the downs and the lockdowns and the liberations or however you want to see that of the, the COVID thing is we need this. We, we need each other. We, we need to do the Christian life together. And I know for, for, for me, in the context of Word of Life, and I, I have the privilege of being part of a team, and we're just doing Christian life together, and we don't get along perfectly, but the importance of being together and doing the Christian life not on your own is, is vital for us in terms of staying faithful to God. We need other people to, to push and to encourage us to spend time in God's Word when we don't have the strength to do it on our own. When it's not something that we really feel like doing, we need to be in God's Word, getting to know Him more. And the best way to do that, and it's the way that God made it by design, is the church. That that's what God left us here for, to be a witness to the world that we live in, but then also at the same time for us to encourage one another in our walk with him. But um, there might be something, this is, that's like the, the bright side of church, and here's like the dark side of church, okay? The dark side of church is that church is filled of people that are not perfect, and that might come as a surprise to you because you might be like, well, I mean, everybody else at church isn't perfect, but I'm like getting there, right? No, I mean, genuinely, and it's the same thing with the context where I live at, at work at Word of Life is that the church is filled with people who aren't perfect. And so in that process of doing life in a body of believers, knowing that we're not perfect, do you think perhaps in the middle of that, you might not agree with everything everybody does? Very likely, whether it's parenting styles or types of music or directions the deacons are leading you or whatever that looks like, they're, they're, every, every parent, every church member, every deacon on the deacon's board is not perfect. Additionally, Pastor Paul's not perfect. Right? And so it's important for us to understand that, that as a body of believers, yes, we're meant to do this Christian life together, but if you expect church to be a place where no one ever offends you and you have hard feelings against somebody, you're planning on being in heaven now, but you're not there yet, okay? Because that's just not going to happen. Um, you're going to get hurt in church. You're, you're going to get hurt everywhere you go because we live in a fallen world. It's not perfect, full of imperfect people, and I am far from it. I'm a big part of that imperfect problem, all right? So that, that is important for us to understand that we're not perfect, but we do need each other. And I think that comes into place here as we look at Philippians chapter 3, and we understand that um, it's very important for, for us to see here that even the Apostle Paul admits that he wasn't perfect. And in terms of like holy people that ever walked the earth, okay, it's like obviously Jesus. That's pretty high up there since he was perfect and had no faults, sinless man of God, right, that died for our sins, that was God incarnate, literally God wearing flesh, dying on the cross for our sins. Okay, that, that was perfect. But then there's other holy people in the Bible, and it's like Moses and Paul. I mean, they got to be up there in terms of impressiveness, okay? But here's Paul. Listen to what he says in verse 12. He says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. So Paul lets us know here in the book of Philippians that he is telling the church in Philippi, he's trying to encourage them to live a life that, it, that honors God, to be a light in the world, and he lets them know that in that process of being the church and being a light, that he isn't perfect. So hopefully we can identify that. We understand we, we live and we minister amongst people who are not perfect. But then this is what I think is so important for us to understand, and this is the principle that I want to encourage you with this morning is the principle of pressing on. Okay, so listen to what it says here in verse 12. We'll start starting at the beginning. It says, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus made me his own. So if you're taking notes this morning, point number one is this, that we need to press on. All right, we need to press on because we are his. And if you understand this, if we understand that who Christ has made us, right, that we were sinful and now we're
with our sins and that we're these spotless people. When God looks at us, he doesn't see our sins anymore. He sees the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made and that God of the universe, part of what happens when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, is that the Holy Spirit, God, starts to live inside of us. And so we have this amazing, incredible Word of God, and we have the God that spoke the world into creation living inside of us. And it says here that He has made us His own. And so in this process of being imperfect but being children of God, we need to understand that that better make a difference in our lives. Right? That, that, that if God lives inside of us, that we should live differently. And it's for, for those of us that perhaps received, for, for me, that I, I was saved at a young age, it's hard for me to realize the, the exact impact that God had in my life from before and after knowing him. But I do know that as I've, as I've gone throughout life, I can see at different times in my life that the only reason I'm standing here, for example, this morning, or that God's doing things in my life and doesn't have to be because I'm a pastor or anything like that, but the only reason that go, that's, that's God's using me is because of God. It's not because of my gifts or my abilities or my talents because I don't have a lot of those. It is because God lives in me. And so if God lives in us, that that should impact how we live. We, we should live differently. And we, so we need to understand that, that in the process of the Christian life, which is very difficult, life is not simple. Life is not easy. There's a lot of hard things we need to work through. But what enables us to do that is that we are God's, that God lives in us. So we are to press on because we are his. And, and check out what it says a little bit here just to understand some more encouragement about that and what that looks like. If you if you look back to verse 8 of chapter 3, it gives us some ideas of what's important in this belonging to God's and living this Christian life. It says this in verse 8, and it says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And so Paul's letting the readers know that what this Christian life looks like, what a relationship with God is, is yes, God lives inside of us, but part of that and how we grow in our relationship with God is getting to know God more. That, that's how we grow. And so um, it's important for us to understand that the, the way that we get to know God is really complicated. Okay, So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain a very complicated process for you. How you get to know God and grow in your relationship with him is this, is you spend time with him. I don't know if you've ever had a relationship before. Probably. All right. So in order to grow in that relationship, for example, you know, as, I, as I've been married to Carla, we happen to spend a lot of time together. That's what happens when you live in the same house. Right? You, you get to know that person more. But to get to know her more, I have to spend time with her. And the more I spend time with her, the more I get to know her. And so it's the same with our relationship with God. It's really not complicated. The way we get to know God more is to spend time with him. And it's, this is like literally the book that God left for us to get to know him. Okay? And so I don't always have, like, I'm thinking of the word in Spanish. I don't always have the desire to, to spend time in God's word. But if I want to grow in my relationship with him, if I want to know him more, this is how God instructs us to do that. And it's not, it doesn't have to be like this boring checklist thing we have to do every day. It, there's different ways to enjoy God's word. Like you can literally now, you can put it on in your car. You can listen to a dramatic reading of it. You can listen to podcasts of people talking about it. You can listen to sermons. You can sit down and, and read it. You can be part of a small group and study it together. There's, there's tons of ways to get to know God more. And that is the most important part of our relationship with God and, and growing and pressing on is getting to know him more. And as we get to know him more, he's going to change the way that we live and perceive life. It's just that simple. But if you do things flipped around on their head and you try to do things in order to get to know God more, it's exhausting. Because the, what we learned here is what gives us the ability to press on is God. God is the one that allows us to press on. He's the, ones that, that, that he's the one that own, owns us. And so if we're drawing on his word and on him for our strength to walk through this Christian life, 
It's doable. Not easy, but doable. Not because of who we are, but because of who he is. However, if we try to do things in order to do the Christian life, we're going to run out of energy, right? If the Christian life is this, and as genuinely most of us wish it was this way, I wish that loving God and pressing on and being a faithful Christian, that God just gave me like a list. Like, Mike, here's four things you need to do every day, and you're going to be a standout Christian. Wake up at six, read your Bible for 25 minutes, pray for 17 minutes, and support three missionaries. Do those three things, and that shows me that you love me. That, that would be very simple. Okay, it would take a bit of time every day, but I could do that. But that, 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 that's not what the Bible says is important here. What, what Paul says, Paul literally ex- has explained in different places, he spent his life trying to f- fulfill the world's largest checklist of loving God, did all those things, and realized that was a bunch of trash. That living that life was miserable, but knowing God, having a relationship with him, completely changes that. And so it's kind of like, it's kind of like, it's like, it's like the difference of this. It's like, this is like, I don't do this all the time, but there's a very big difference in my relationship with Carla. If I feel like I have to do things in order to prove to her that I love her. Okay, so for example, um, if I decide this doesn't happen as much as it should, but there's like dishes in the, in the sink. If I decide like, I got to show Carl I love her. I'm going to, I'm going to prove that I love her. And this is, so I'm going to, I'm going to do the dishes. And then when I'm done the dishes, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to just show, I'm going to prove that I really mean what I say when I say I love you. And I'm going to sweep the floor and I'm going to maybe mop, probably not mop, but think about mopping it. Okay. I'm going to do all these things. It's like, at the end of that, I'm like exhausted. I'm like, I hope she notices I did these things so that it proves to her that I, that I love her. You can do relationships that way. Okay. Flip side of that is I could be like, I, I love Carla. And because I love her and I know her, I'm going to do the dishes and I do them. It's the same task. I finish it and I, I don't care if she sees because I didn't do it for that reason. I did it just because I know her and I love her. You understand the difference? That's, that's a, if you live your, your, your marriage that way, okay, it's still hard and it's not perfect and she's imperfect and I'm imperfect. So there's all those things wrapped up in that. But that's an enjoyable way to have a relationship. It's not bent on, it's not wrapped around or concerned all the time about this checklist. It's just getting to know her more and responding to my, my knowing her and loving her by what that looks like, and then doing things as a result of that. And so that's what a relationship with God should look like. And then it goes on in verse 10. It says, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, in verse 10. And so this idea of the power of his resurrection, I actually heard someone preaching on this this week, and what he was saying is this, that this word power really means the, the ability to press through resistance. So he explained, like, if you have a mountain and a train needs to go through, that you can use this powerful thing called dynamite and blow a hole in the mountain, and then that removes the resistance and gives you the ability to go through. And so what God gives us through his word, okay, and through the sacrifice that he made for us, is this ability to, to go through life with this power from him to, with, to, to be able to stand firm and continue on and press on in the midst of resistance. Um, Because as you've gone through this life, you've probably realized um, there's a lot of things that are trying to to discourage us and to get us down and to make us feel like this life, one, is not worth living for God, and two, might not even be worth living at all. If you're being honest, at some point in your Christian walk, you've probably thought through one or both of those things, or maybe it's something you're working through right now, wondering, is this Christian life worth living and actually, is life even worth living at all? And we, we work through trying to figure out, well, well, what does that look like? And then how do we have strength to do that? Well, as believers, we have the ability to, to press on because of what Christ did in and through our lives, because of what he did on the cross. Okay, so we are his. We can press on because we are his. And knowing that we have a relationship with God, and if God lives in us, that should transform how we live our lives. Okay, does that make sense? So we're supposed to press on because we are his, transformed because of who he is and because of what he's done. So we press on. Okay, verse 13 says this. 
Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining to what lies ahead. Straining forward to what lies ahead. So point number two, if you're taking notes, is this, is press on. Straining forward. Press on what? Press on forgetting what lies behind. And if there's one thing I think that can probably be the number one thing to derail a Christian from a successful life in service to God is the inability to look at things that need to be left in the past, that need to be forgiven and moved on from, and to dwell on those things day in and day out. As we mentioned, we, we live in churches full of imperfect people. And so at some point, someone in this room has probably offended you. And if you haven't worked through a God-honoring way to resolve that, and you're just letting that hard feeling harbor in your heart all the time and bitterness is growing, if that's the, the, what defines our life is just this, this hard feeling towards other people and, and this person said this to me or this person didn't say that to me or they, they treated me this way, as, as hard as that might have been, okay, that is going to disable you from being able to be effective for God. Because in order to press on, it says we need to forget what lies behind. And that, so in the context of that, I, I don't know what type of hurt or difficult thing has happened in your past, okay? That there might have been some very, very difficult things. And that doesn't mean in the process of forgiving or forgetting that we just put ourselves in a situation that allows us to be hurt in that same way as before. You know, if something ter terrible or illegal has happened, we, we need to deal with that in a way that honors the Lord. And there's, there's processes to work through that. So I'm not saying... We just put ourselves out there to be hurt in a terrible way again. But we do need to make sure that we work through God-honoring forgiveness of other brothers and sisters in Christ. Because, um, I mean, I was just meeting with a lot of missionaries that love the Lord. And the number one thing I heard that was discouraging them was not their economic situation, was not how hard life is, was not how much energy they have or how much sleep they get. What discouraged them the most was other Christians' attitudes and how that's impacted their life. And, 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 and in that, right, and I'm, I'm, I struggle with this sometimes too. It's like, well, I don't, like, I'm, I'm doing this thing for the Lord and this person never does anything for the Lord and now I'm trying to figure out how we balance those things out or I don't do anything in the church because nobody loves me and this person does. Those things happen all the time. And if we're going to live in those, that way, if we're going to just live this life full of bitterness towards other believers, we're not going to be effective in our relationship with the Lord. We're not going to be used by him in great ways in the time that we have here on earth. And so in order to press on, we need to forget what lies behind. And I love some additional context here because we don't get to go through the whole book. If you look back to chapter 2, verses 14, so as we try to press on and as we forgive others, understand as well as believers what we're not supposed to do all right, and this is where, honestly, this is probably the biggest struggle I have in my life, okay? Verse 14 says, Do all things without grumbling or dispute, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you are to shine as lights in the world. So in the process of living this life that honors God by pressing on through his strength in a way that honors and glorifies him and forgetting what lies behind, the context of doing that also includes doing all things without grumbling or disputing. Why? Because we're supposed to be a light in the world that we live in. Sometimes I, I struggle and I try to figure out, like, how can I be more effective in being a light for Christ in the world that I live in today? And how can the church be a bigger impact in terms of being a light in the community? You know, how can Fellowship Baptist be a greater light for, for Collingwood? Well, if we're consumed with these things, right, if we're grumbling and disputing and we're not leaving what lies behind and we're not relying on God's strength— People are going to look at us and they'll be like, that's a group of people that get together on Sunday that don't even really like each other, okay? Because every time I talk to them, they're complaining about someone at church and something that they didn't like at the church service or, and I'm, I mean, why would I go there so I can sit in the same building and they can say the same things about me? 
That, that's, that's not a great way to be a light to people. And, and so I need to watch myself when I'm talking to people. Yes, I need to be honest about what's going on in life, okay? If, if we're the type of Christian that's just like we're sitting down with someone having a heart-to-heart, and they're like, how are you doing? You're like, great. I'm a Christian, and everything is, I wake up every day, and I'm happy. And, and then I look at my list of things to do today, and I'm like, praise the Lord. He's going to get me through. I mean, life's hard, right? It, it's a, we need to be genuine and honest with people, but if when people talk to us, what, what they see is a bunch of bitter, grumbling, disputing, arguing people that get together once a week to sing some songs and then leave and don't talk to each other on the way out, it's like, we're not going to be a light. I'm sorry. I, I wish we could be, but we won't be. And so as Christians, we're supposed to press on forgetting what lies behind. All right, so press on because we are his. Press on forgetting what, forgetting what lies behind. And then verse 14 says this, I press on towards the goal for the prize and the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. All right, so point number three is press on, okay? Press on towards the goal. And so what is this goal? It tells us very clearly what this is in verses 20 to 21, which I love when the Bible explains to us what it's trying to say. So it says this, this is our goal. This is what we look forward to. It says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You understand that hope? Okay, and then it goes on and says, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And so as believers in Jesus Christ, we have this glorious hope of these two things that Paul's letting us know, okay? One, and these are the two things I look forward to most in terms of being in heaven, is one, okay, we get to be with Christ. Literally saying this Savior's coming, he's coming to take us and for us to be with him. So the most incredible thing is when this is all said and done, Okay, we have this glorious hope that we will spend all of eternity with Jesus Christ. All of eternity, which we can't even get our minds around, but we get to spend all eternity with the God that that spoke the world into creation. I don't know if you've ever taken time looking at some incredible pictures that they're taking now with this new infrared like telescope, but we, we get to see these galaxies and stars and like it blows our minds and we, that God left there for us to see and give glory to him and understanding how complicated the human body is and how the world works and, and all these, like this God that created all these unbelievable things that also deserves to be glorified and worship with every fiber of my being, but that who decided because he loves me, he would die for me because I didn't deserve that, but he did that anyways, and that I get to spend forever in his presence and glory. When I think about that and then I look at how hard life is, and it's hard, uh, 6,000 years into eternity, the fact that for I couldn't take three minutes to sit down with someone and say, like, hey, you, you offended me. I mean, there's a situation going on, and you said this thing. It, it really upset me. You might not even know that it did, but let's just work through this and just, 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 just try to forgive one another so that we can honor the Lord in our relationship so we can be a light in this world for the, the couple years that we're here. Like, a three-minute conversation. 6,000 years into eternity, I'm going to be thinking, well, I didn't have three minutes? What, what are we talking about? Like, three minutes to, to, to honor that person. 6,000 years into enjoying God's presence and being with them. It's just important for us to understand that that's what we're aiming towards, that we are going to spend eternity with the God who died for our sins, even though we didn't deserve it. So that's one of the incredible goals we look towards. We look towards the fact that this place is not our home. We should not be comfortable or feel at home while we're here. Yes, we have our homes and our families, and that's incredible, but we weren't, we're not meant to be here for forever. It's just a time. We're going to go home one day, and from that day forward, we'll be home forevermore. And so we look forward and are excited about the fact that this is just a little while. It's just a little while. And in that, praying that God will give us the strength to continue on just one more day. The next thing that's incredible that we see in that passage and we understand is that one day we will be given this new glorified body. So not only will we be with Christ, we'll be like Christ. I cannot wait for the day when I no longer have to wrestle with sin. Like, like 
that genuinely. Number one thing I look forward to in heaven, seeing Jesus. Number two, not sinning. Because it's exhausting being like, God, I want to I love you and I want to serve you, but I just I keep having these terrible attitudes. I, someone says this thing and, and I snap, or someone talks this way and I just think these not great thoughts about them, or I, I can't stop not feeling this way towards this person that hurt me, or whatever that may look like, to understand what it's going to look like, being able to stand before God and not feel guilty about anything ever again for all of eternity. I don't, know if, I don't know about you, but you guys did communion last week, and sometimes when they're passing the cup around, and we're like praying, and I'm working through like in my heart where I'm at, and I think about the sin in my life, and I'm, try, I'm like, do I drink the cup? Because like, I'm not feeling like I deserve to do that, because I'm feeling pretty sinful this morning, and I probably should let it go, but then if I let it go, what are people going to think? And so I take it, and I drink it, and, and, I, and I forget that I'm drinking the cup because I don't deserve it. That's the point, right? That, that Jesus died in my place. So that's what I'm doing when I'm doing that. But I can't wait for the day where I get to never have to think about that again. I'm just like, God, I just spent the last week only glorifying you with every moment of my day, never doing one thing that dishonored you. And I, now that I think about it, I've been doing that for thousands of years, and it's incredible. So that's the hope that we have as believers, that we're not just running this race in vain. We're running towards a goal, and the goal is we get to spend forever and ever with our Savior, and we get to be like him. And so that should give us energy to press on. Through the ups and the downs of life, we get to press on understanding that one day we will be with him, and one day we will be like him. So we need to press on. Verse 15 says this, and this is where um, sometimes... I wish the Bible said different things than it does, but listen to what this says here in verse 15. So understanding as believers, we're supposed to press on. Verse 15 says this, let those who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So again, at the beginning of that says, let those who are mature think this way. All right, I don't know for you what you use to describe what being spiritually mature is, But lots of times when we think of spiritual maturity, we don't think about what the Bible says. So spiritual maturity is not this, okay? Spiritual maturity is not showing someone how many times you've read the Bible. Spiritual maturity is not saying that, like, well, how long did you pray today? Well, I woke up at 6, I prayed for an hour and a half. And spiritual maturity is not being at church every Sunday, being at prayer meeting. That, That Those things are great, those things that we can use to get to know God more. But that is not what spiritual maturity is. Checking off things on the list does not equal spiritual maturity. According to God's word here, what spiritual maturity is, what it equals, is the ability to press on. That's what it looks like to be a believer in Jesus Christ. To understand that this life is not easy and to have the strength by God's grace to continue to serve him one more day That is spiritual maturity. And the incredible thing is that's actually what we'll be able to, that's how God uses us to be a light in this world. Because when people see Christians and they understand that we go through the same difficulties that they do, but somehow we have this ability to continue to worship a God that we know that loves us, even when people look at our life and say, you think your God loves you when this happened? Like, how, how does that work? And you're like, no, he does. And I'm going to continue to press on to serve him because I don't love him because of things he gives me. I love him because of who he is and because of what he's done. And as we do that, as we press on, people will see there, there's something different about how they live their life. They have hope in the middle of a hopeless world. If you talk to anybody about what the purpose of life is, if you look at philosophies in the past, it's it's hopeless. There's literally no purpose to live life at all other than to enjoy today, which is, there's no hope in that because then what, what happens tomorrow? So I try that again tomorrow. It's like that, 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 that there's no hope in that style of life. But for us as Christians, we have this incredible hope that our God has a plan, even if we can't see it. Right? And, and, I, and I don't know, like I mentioned before, I don't know what difficult things God's allowed into your life. I know I've shared this with you guys before sometimes, but one, one thing that God has allowed to be part of our life, and we, we praise the Lord for this, is that, that my oldest son, Oliver, ha- has Down syndrome. 
right? And I, we love him like crazy, and I wouldn't change a thing about him. But it's one of those things where when that happens, and people can say, like, didn't, don't you pray to God, and isn't he supposed to, like, why would a God that's loving allow something like that to happen? And there's days where I, I praise God for the impact that Oliver has in my life, and he's teaching me how to be more patient and to be more loving. But I also struggle some days because I'm like, how is this good for him? I, I, that, that part of things, I know God has a plan, but I, I don't understand how it actually is good for him because it's hard, and he knows he can't say things when he should be able to, and he knows his life's going to be, like, it's very hard for him. But regardless of that, I know, even if it doesn't make sense to me, the promises that God's made, and I know that he is a good God. I know that he does have a plan, and even when it doesn't make sense to me, God gives me strength to press on just one more day. And that's what it looks like to be spiritually mature. We don't have to be perfect in that, and we won't be, but we do continue to press on. And so the amazing thing is, and this is kind of how it ties into my trip with Argentina, is it's been about 10 years since I've been down there. And as I was preparing to share there, I shared something very similar with the team down there, which I never thought I'd be sitting in front of like my professors and preaching the word to them. But I was sharing a little bit about this, and I I was just thinking about, and I praise the Lord, I was just looking at, different people there who 10 years later are still serving God faithfully and like not doing glorious things. The one guy that I just, I I praise the Lord for his life, his job literally is to oversee dish pit. That is not a glamorous job. And he's still faithfully serving the Lord doing that and with joy. Not every day, I'm sure, but generally in joy. And I look at his life, and he's just excited to explain what God's doing in and through his life and how God's used him. And that encouraged me immensely. But then also, that's one thing that God helped me realize is I stopped and I was like, you know, standing there and, and, and getting ready to share with these people. And, and I realized, just looking back at who I was 10 years before, and I was like, by God's grace, I am not the same person I was 10 years ago. Day by day, I get so frustrated with how slowly I'm growing in the Lord. But if I look back 10 years, I can be like, holy smokes, like God, God did things in my life. I, I'm by his by God's grace, I'm not the same person that was 10 years ago. And there were days I didn't think I was going to have strength to go on for one more day, but here, here I am because of who God is. And the incredible thing, as I realized, is I'm not, I'm getting older, but I'm not super old yet, okay? That like, so I'm like 34, I think, okay? So 10 years ago, I was 24. And so I just think, all right, so God kept me faithful by his grace these past 10 years and used me for his glory, even though I was far from perfect in all of those things. Genuinely, God, all I need to do is just pray that you give me the strength to do that four or five more times. That's it. I, it does, it's like literally, God, give me strength to do what, I, what, what you did through my life four more times and then I'm with you for eternity. Or it could be sooner. Maybe God decides that's not how long I'm going to live. But God, just, just, just give me the strength to do it one more time. God, give me the strength to, to press on for your honor and for your glory just, just a couple more times. And then I'm, I'm there. I'm with you forever. This is going to seem like a, literally a dot in my total story. So God, just please give me the strength to press on just one more day. And so I don't know where you're at in life, but just stop and think about how God's used you these past 10 years and, and what he's done in your life. And just pray that God gives you the strength to do that. Maybe for some of us, it's just one more time. God, one more time, 10 more years. Give me the strength to press on for 10 more years, and then I'm with you. And it's going to be so worth it. It won't be easy, but it'll be worth it. And help me to have strength to do that. But the incredible thing that I realized as I was praying through that and understanding what it's talking about here and the purpose of doing things in the, in the, as a body of believers, is that some days I don't have the strength on my own to press on one more day. And, and, and I need someone else to come alongside me like Paul was doing for this church here and to say, Mike, I know you don't want to. I know you don't have the strength, but let's just, let's just get up together and let's encourage each other to press on. It doesn't have to be for 100 more years. Let's just get through today, Mike. You know, could you imagine what church would be like if when we met together, you can tell, I mean, you can tell when someone's not okay, Right, and I know we ask the question and we wonder, and then sometimes we, we we pray a bit. But what would it be like if you're like, "Hey, something's up. Can we just like pull each other aside and can I just pray for you that God would give you strength to get through just one more day, and that He would put that He give you a desire to spend time in your word in His word, and and if you don't even want to do that, maybe we could get together and I, and I could help you and we can encourage each other to to continue to press on because we don't have much longer here, and this isn't our home. 
and, and God's given us the strength because we are his to press on. And we need to lay those things behind that need to be left behind. And we need to press on and we need to continue to press on towards that goal as we strive to be mature believers, to be a light in this world. Could, could we just do that together just for another day? And so for me, that, that's, that's my prayer for you as a church. And it's really been encouraging to me because um, sometimes when I think about trying to live the Christian life, it's like, I think about what I should do and I realize I can't do that. I'm like, I can't do all these things. I'm never going to be able to. I can't even figure out like everything and how I'm supposed to do those things. But I, I do think that I can try to be faithful to the Lord by, by his grace. And I do think that I could pray to God to help me get through today. And then when tomorrow comes, I'll just pray he gives me strength for tomorrow too and encourage other people to do that. And in the middle of that, you'll be mind blown by the fact that God, that people will look at your life and be like, there's a person who's still going to church, who loves the people that go to church even though they hurt them sometimes, who worships a God who allows difficult things to happen in their life just like he does in mine, yet they continue to press on and to love him and to worship him and to say that he's worth surrendering all their lives to and that they would give anything for him. And they have this hope that they get to see him and spend forever with him. I'd kind of like to know about that God. And then we get to share the gospel with them. And God is honored and God is glorified. And so that's my prayer for you, that you'd be able to, by God's grace, continue to press on for his honor and for his glory. So let me pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this day, God. I just thank you for your words. And so, God, I don't know where people are at this morning, but I'm sure there's some people today that just want to throw in the towel. And so... God, I pray that you would just wrap other brothers and sisters in the Lord around them, Lord, that you would just encourage them and just to give them the strength, God, to, to get through today, Lord, that they would realize that you love them, that you died for them, that they can find the strength to do that through you, even though they don't feel like they can, but you are able, God. And so I pray that you would strengthen them. Lord, if there's someone here that's just been sitting on something um, that someone's done to them, some, some bitterness for, for a long time in their hearts, God, I pray that you would help them um, just to have a desire to make that right, to leave those things behind and to, to maybe seek forgiveness or to just start the process of forgiving someone, Lord. And that could take time, but I pray they'd have a desire to start that today. And Lord, for each and every one of us, God, I just pray that we would keep the goal in mind, Lord, to understand that we're here for such a short amount of time and then we get to spend eternity with you. And so, God, I pray that we'd help that time that we have here um, to be used wisely for your honor, for your glory and your precious name.